want to welcome everybody uh, to this, our uh, ninth Wilmette Institute web talk of the year 2015. This is our um, 20th anniversary, as you probably have heard, and we are celebrating it in various ways, one of which is by uh, doing these web talks. We're already beginning to plan the 2016 web talks. This has been such a successful uh, experiment that we will probably do 12 next year as well. And if you have suggestions for people we could uh, invite to speak, we would certainly welcome them because uh, we'll be planning things over the next uh, two or three months. The Wilmot Institute was established by the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States in January of 1995. That's why this is our 20th year. And for 10 years, we focused primarily on a face-to-face -face program known as the Spiritual Foundations for a Global Civilization program. Uh, that particular program eventually ran its course as uh, Ruhi kicked in in particular, and more and more people were taking those uh, classes uh, in their local communities. There was less and less interest to come to Wilmette for, uh, initially it was a month, but even at the end it was still nine days in order to do intensive face-to-face -face classes. We had started online classes in 1998, and we also used them for spiritual foundations. That was our chance to practice uh, our online content. And in 1998, 1998, we only had two classes or so, and maybe 100 students altogether. To date, since that time, uh, I've just updated the statistics about 15 minutes ago, we've had 8,931 registrations uh, for 322 courses from about 110 different countries. So we've had really quite a remarkable uh, reach and we're of course continuing to expand. We're now offering about 50 courses uh, every year and next year it looks like it will be slightly more than that. In addition to our courses, um, of course people are using this material to make presentations to study circles, um, deepening classes, and many other meetings. We really have no idea how many people have become Baha'is as a result of Wilmot Institute classes, but we're guessing that hundreds have at least heard of the faith through people who therefore had more confidence to mention the faith, to answer questions as a result of our classes. So we think that that's the main impact we've had in terms of spreading the word of Baha'u'llah to larger numbers of people. The web talks have been one of our innovations this year, but we're also offering webinars now, which are courses you have to pay for, but they, their main focus is on a video class, a live video class. Uh, we're also working on web publications, and we hope eventually uh, to move in the direction of offering courses that university students can take for credit. Today, we have Bahariye Rouhani Ma'ani uh, to speak about materials from her book on the women in the holy family. Uh, the book is called Leaves of the Twin Divine Trees. It's an in-depth study of the lives of women closely related to the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Uh, and this particular uh, account really is, is, I think, going to be quite gripping and quite interesting to us. Uh, she has also written um, Against Incredible Odds, Life of a 20th Century Running Baha'i Family. She's worked on a book, uh, Laws of the Kitabi Akdas, tracing their evolution in religious history with her daughter, Soveda Ma'ani Ewing, and of course a book on Asi Echonum, the most exalted leaf entitled Navab, plus various articles in English and Persian, mostly on the status of women uh, in religion. She helped to translate um, Years of Silence um, and uh, various some various other books here, extracts from memorial, um, a pilgrimage book that's in, uh, published in the Baha'i Worlds, translated many tablets, revealed to and about women, some of which were in the compilation on women published at the World Center. She worked at the uh, World Center for many years. So with that, I think we should uh, switch over to Bahariye and uh, enjoy her presentation today on the women of the Holy Family, the leaves of the twin divine trees. Greetings, everyone, wherever you may be. In the next 40 minutes or so, I'll be talking about the course, about the effect of women's traditional anonymity on the early history of the Baha'i faith, on relationship between gender inequality 
and treatment of women in religious history, also about women in the Bobby and early Baha'i history, about women's history and legacy, and finally, about the need for reconsidering old criteria to ensure women's fair treatment in religious history. Now about the course. This is the first time a course of this nature is being offered by the Wilmette Institute. I can't tell you how gratifying it is to see this course finally becoming a part of the Wilmette Institute courses offered. It provides an ideal forum for interested individuals to study and discuss the lives of women closely related to the Bab and Baha'u'llah. The course is based on Leaves of the Twin Divine Trees, a book published by George Ronald in early 2009. Some of the women covered in the course have made vital contributions at critical junctures to the development of the Bobby and Baha'i faiths. The crucial part played by the two mothers who bore, raised, and protected the Bab and Baha'u'llah at different stages of their lives, no one can deny. Yet, until quite recently, their lives were shrouded in obscurity and the generality of the believers, particularly non-Persian speaking friends, knew very little, if any at all, about these two women. Some other outstanding women closely related to the twin manifestations of God did likewise remain almost anonymous for many decades, not because their sufferings and achievements did not deserve historical coverage, but because covering women's feats in history was not something tradition encouraged or embraced. Lack of adequate information about these women and the services they have rendered have produced the outcome we would have wanted to avoid. Justice requires that credit be given where it's due. It should apply to every aspect of life, including religious history, which should not be excused for not having treated women fairly. The best known among the leaves of the twin divine trees is Baha'i Khanum, the greatest holy leaf. The reason we have ample information about her, designated by Baha'u'llah as the most outstanding heroine of his dispensation, is not due to historians' efforts to lift the veil of obs obscurity from this unique historical figure. It is rather owed to Shoghi Afandi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith. 
He is the one who made known to the Baha'is of the world Baha'i Khanum's towering personality, her station, and the value of the services she rendered for decades to the cause proclaimed by her father. The legendary lives some of these women lived and the unique services they have rendered will no doubt inspire and guide future generations, particularly women. The course on the leaves of the twin divine trees serves to highlight the legacy left by the women closely related to the Bab and Baha'u'llah. It also sheds light on some ambiguous areas of our history. Why women suffered obscurity in the early years of the development of the Baha'i faith is a question worth exploring briefly in this presentation. To do that, it suffices to take a cursory look at the plight of women in the annals of humanity. Women's anonymity in religious history is based on deep-rooted biases against them. the genesis of which no one can pinpoint with accuracy and certainty. These biases are responsible for the way women have been treated in early history of our faith. As a result, a degree of obscurity exists regarding women's contribution to the early development of the cause of God, which is very difficult to penetrate. The long delay in compiling reliable and documented information about women closely related to the Bab and Baha'u'llah, indeed about all early women believers in the East generally and in Iran particularly, has contributed to the loss of invaluable material about them. The main reason for this regrettable phenomenon is the ancient practice of gender inequality. What women did was traditionally considered unimportant, deserving, except in rare cases, no acknowledgement. Historians were invariably men. Women were generally deprived of the blessing of education and divested of the means to record their own history. Men, on the other hand, were conditioned to ignore or minimize what women did a glance at how humanity got to that point opens before us intriguing vistas. Scripture has been the standard bearer of gender equality. The first chapter of the book of Genesis confirms the equality of men and women and assigns to them identical functions. Let's study together this, these verses from the book of Genesis. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, semicolon, male and female created he, 
them. This last phrase is a crucial point. And this is the one I have highlighted. Male and female created he, them. Then continues, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. From Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Abdul Baha has confirmed the biblical statement, let us ma make man in our image, after our likeness, does not mean that woman was not created. The image and likeness of God apply to her as well. This has been quoted in Women, Compilation on Women, number 17. Now, as you can see, men and women were created equal. But we don't know how long women's intended equality with men actually lost them lasted. What we know is that it suffered retrogression at some point. Also we know that the original account of creation giving men and women equal status to enjoy and functions to perform was retold in subsequent chapters of the book of Genesis. Briefly, man was formed of the dust of the ground, woman was created from his rib. Then serpent was introduced into the mix, the intent being the subjugation of woman. Although the story confirms that Adam and Eve were both deceived by the serpent, disobeyed God, and ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, woman bore the brunt of the punishment meted out to them. And to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Introducing husbands as rulers and using women's God-given bounty of bearing and giving birth to children as punishments for their perceived transgression appears to have been the first foundational stone in the structure of gender inequality leading over time to the widely accepted practice of men's superiority over women. One of the most unfortunate consequences of the introduction of gender inequality in religion has been the mistreatment of women, which continues to this day in some parts of the world. In support of women's subordination to men, St. Paul says, 
A man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither is the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. He also says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. This is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Some improvements were made in the status of women by Prophet Muhammad who confirmed that men and women were created from a living entity, and out of the two, multitudes of men and women were brought into being. He says, O mankind, addressing all of humanity, be conscious of your sustainer, who has created you of one living entity, and out of it created its mate, and out of the two spread abroad a multitude of men and women, and remain conscious of God in whose name you demand in brackets your rights from one another, and of these ties of kinship. Verily, God is ever watchful over you. Quran chapter 4, verse 1, and Asad is the translator or interpreter. The revelation of this verse should have brought about tremendous improvement in the status of women. However, whatever improvement it occasioned was overshadowed by another verse, which reads, Men shall take full care of women with the bounties which God has bestowed more abundantly on the former than on the latter, and with what they may spend out of their possessions. And the righteous women are the truly devout ones who guard the intimacy which God has, in brackets, ordained to be end of brackets, guarded. And as for those women whose ill will you have reason to fear, admonish them first, in brackets, then leave them alone in bed, then beat them, if thereupon they pay, if thereupon they pay you heed, do not seek to harm them. Behold, God is indeed most high, great. Quran chapter 4, verse 34. The improvements introduced by Prophet Muhammad in the status of women eroded before they could be fully implemented. Men's obsession with their perceived superiority over women prevented the establishment of gender equality in Islam. As a result, women continued to be under the thumb of 
men's authority and their status degraded steadily. Abdul Baha explains the reason for men's ascendancy in past ages. In former ages, Abdul Baha says, men enjoyed ascendancy over women because bodily might reigned supreme and the spirit was subject to its dominion. Women number 10. That's the compilation on women. Now, with the coming of the twin manifestations of God in mid-19th century, the dawn of humanity's coming of age broke out, and the dominion of bodily might over the spirit began to fade. However, it left marks on the early history of our faith. Now I like to address the Babi and early Baha'i history. One of the unfortunate, one of the many unfortunate consequences of the introduction of gender inequality in religion has been women's invisibility in religious history. That invisibility regrettably has affected the early history of our faith. We seldom, if at all, see an eyewitness account related to our early history traced to a woman despite the fact that except for the fort of Tabarsi, women participated in major events and lost their lives for what they believe. Countless other women sacrificed everything, yet except for Tahere and to a much lesser extent a few others have remained nameless and traceless. The reason? They did not fit the mold cast by men for judging what qualified a person for historical treatment. The women in Iran were generally illiterate, unable to read and write. They could not record their observations or express opinion about matters that men considered important and historians focused upon. Stepping outside the bounds of accepted norms was totally unacceptable. The only means of survival for women was compliance with status quo. True compliance, which worked totally to their disadvantage, they were able to render invaluable services to the nascent faith under unbearable circumstances. They remained steadfast in their conviction and raised the children left fatherless and without protection. I'm talking about those, those men who were martyred and left their children unprotected. And these were the women who provided sustenance and protection for those children. These women kept the light of the faith burning brightly in the hearts of the next generation. What they did was not only from behind the veil, but also from behind the sea. Unnoticed and 
and unrecognized. Those who noticed anything considered it women's duty, nothing out of the ordinary they thought. It's no wonder then that women are more or less absent from the pages of the early history of the faith. One of the early women believers is Khadija Bagom, the wife of the Ba. She is the first among the Afnans to believe. She is also the first to teach another member of the Afnan family, the Babi faith. The sufferings she bore, the sacrifices she made, and the deprivations she sustained by virtue of her close relationship to the Ba, the mind cannot fully grasp. Luckily, she was asked and spoke of the events she witnessed. One of the inquirers was the woman who married Abdul Baha and became known as Monira Khanum. She met the wife of the Bab in Shiraz in 1871, while she was passing through the city on her way to the Holy Land. Monira Khanum was literate. She wrote about meeting Khadija Bagom in her memoirs, which were published in both Persian and English during the early years of Shobhya Fendi's ministry. We also have the book by the late Hand of the Cause of God, Hassan Baluzi. It is based on Khadija Bagom's recollections as recorded in the memoirs of her great nephew. The book is titled Khadija Bagom, The Wife of the Bab. During the ministry of Abdul Baha, two Westerners recorded and published the recollections of the greatest holy leaf. Both interviews were conducted through a third party serving as interpreter. One of them recorded and published also the recollections of other women members of Abdul Baha's family. Their attempts resulted in a book by Myron Henry Phelps titled Life and Teachings of Abbas Afandi, another by Lady Bloomfield titled The Chosen Highway, which has been quoted extensively by those who have written about the greatest holy leaf and Monira Khanum. There were other women who witnessed, even were involved in historical events. But their recollections no one recorded and therefore have been lost. The absence of vital information about prominent women related to the Bab and Baha'u'llah has made feeling the existing gaps in the early history of the faith a difficult task. Collecting stories about the lives of these women would not have fulfilled the debt owed to them. Only a book based on reliable, documented information, scant as it is, could attempt to remedy the situation to some degree. Making available what had already been published in Persian and English would have been very inadequate. Therefore, access to unpublished information was essential if the book was to shed light on the dark corners of the part women had played in shaping some historical events in the early years, in the early years of the faith. The most valuable of the unpublished sources are the writings of the central figures revealed in honor of the women believers. Also those revealed about a few 
who unfortunately broke the covenant. When the goal was defined, the object of the quest became clear, and search of the published sources exhausted, permission was sought from the Supreme Body to study these writings. Permission was graciously granted, and work began in earnest. After the tablets were identified and copies obtained through established process, they had to be translated from Arabic and Persian to English, a lengthy process considering that full time could not be devoted to the task. The translations were then submitted for approval before they could be used as provisional translations in the book. The contents of these tablets provide invaluable information, impossible to obtain elsewhere. For writing an account of the lives of, the lives of women related to the Bab and Baha'u'llah, I have used Shobi Afandi's treatment of the greatest holy leaf and Asiya Khanum titled Nabab as an ideal model. On the occasion of the transfer of Asiya Khanum, <coughs> of Asiya Khanum's remains, excuse me, and those of her martyred son, the purest branch, to the slopes of Mount Carmel in Haifa <clears throat> in December 1939, Shobi Effendi provided a brief account of her life, including the English translation of some of Baha'u'llah's tablets revealed in her honor. The contents of those tablets alone reveal the remarkable station that Asiya Khanum occupies in the annals of religion. Again, when the greatest holy leaf passed away, Shobi Effendi issued highly significant and moving tributes in English and Persian, which and wailed to the friends in the East and West, her unique personality, station, and the sufferings she endured, the sacrifices she made, and the services she rendered. It would not therefore be inaccurate to say that he, that is Shobhi Afandi, laid the ground for bringing into focus the fading legacy of prominent women related to Baha'u'llah. Before Shobhi Afandi's tributes were disseminated, it would have been most unlikely for anyone to suggest that at the time of Abdul Baha's absence in the Western world, the greatest holy leaf was his competent deputy, his representative and vice gerent with none to equal him. This is from Bahia Khanum, The Greatest Holy Leaf, page 28. This highly significant point is enshrined in one of Abdul Baha's tablets revealed in her honor. Had the tablet been available to the friends and the significance of the part she played in the early history of the faith detected by anyone, that person would have lacked the authority to pronounce it so categorically as did Shobhi Afandi. His statement brought this aspect of her life into focus and silenced 
the would-be objectors. As a result of the tablets revealed by Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha in her honor, which Shoghi Effendi included in his messages, the greatest holy leaf's place in history was made very clear. Fifty years after her passing and the publication of Shoghi Effendi's tributes to her, the Universal House of Justice authorized a project that culminated in the publication of a comprehensive book about her, titled Bahia Khanum, The Greatest Holy Leaf. The book, with an introduction by Amatul Bahar Ruhi Khanum, brings together the tablets of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, revealed in her honor, Shoghi Effendi's writings about her, and her own letters. Concerning the major role she played in the history of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Effendi says, Only future generations and pens abler than mine can and will pay a worthy tribute to the towering grandeur of her spiritual life. To the unique part she played throughout the tumultuous stages of Baha'i history, to the expressions of unqualified praise that have streamed from the pen of both Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, the center of his covenant, though unrecorded and in the main unsuspected by the mass of passionate admirers, in e by her passionate admirers in East and West, the share she has had in influencing, the share she has had in influencing the course of some of the chief events in the annals of the faith, the sufferings she bore, the sacrifices she made, the rare gifts of unfading sympathy she so strikingly displayed, these and many others stand so inextricably interwoven with the fabric of the cause itself that no future historian of the faith of Baha'u'llah can afford to ignore or minimize. What a warning to the historians not to minimize the part she played, to ignore or minimize the part she played in the history of our faith. Again, he says, and yet history, no less than the annals of our immortal faith, shall record for her a share in the advancement and consolidation of the worldwide community which the hand of Abdul Baha had helped to fashion, which no one among the remnants of his family can rival. These passages, both of these passages, are from Bahia Khanum, the greatest holy leaf. Now, finally, what can be done to ensure women's fair treatment in religious history? The near exclusion of half of humanity for millennia from befit befitting coverage in religious history 
has left a huge gap in historical records. The treatment of women in religious history, no one can claim to have been fair. The reason, until quite recently, men determined criteria regarding who and what merited to be treated in religious history. Women and their work, generally speaking, were kept outside the sphere of such treatment. Women and their work, generally speaking, were kept outside the sphere of such treatment. As a result, the work undertaken and the achievements made by one half of humanity have been at best marginalized, at worst ignored. Until about a century ago, they were effectively barred from voicing objection to their exclusion or seeking a resolution of the unfair treatment. We know that many measures need be taken to overcome the adverse effects of unequal treatment of women in religion. One effective way would be to acknowledge contribution that have made that women have made to the progress of any given religion. To do that, the established criteria which work in favor of men and to the disadvantage of women need be equalized to include those areas in which women are strong and most effective. Success will be assured when humanity rids itself of all kinds of prejudices in its widely, distribu in its widely distributed promise of world peace, the Universal House of Justice says, and this would be the last slide I, sh I share, and with it I end the talk and leave room for questions. Let's see. World order can be founded only on an unshakable consciousness of the oneness of mankind. A spiritual truth which all the human, all human sciences confirm. Recognition of this truth requires abandonment of prejudice, prejudice of every kind, race, class, color, creed, nation, sex, degree of material civilization, everything which enables people to consider themselves superior to others. The promise of world peace, quoted in women, number 35. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Bahari A. Uh, this was fascinating, and I think probably something our audience will want to listen to many, many times. I'm sure it will be very popular on YouTube as well for many years. Uh, we, I don't know if we have questions yet. I'll take a look and see. Uh, but I do have one question uh, based on our conversation of the other, uh, the other day. Uh, you had made some very interesting comments to me about the impact of the Iranian Revolution on the 
role of women in the faith in Iran. And I thought uh, perhaps if you could say something about that, uh, our audience would be interested in that. I think the Islamic revolution in Iran um, highlighted the value of women's contribution and what they had achieved in the faith when some women were martyred for their belief and for the kind of services where they were rendering like uh, teaching children's classes um, it really brought to the fore the importance of this vital force that exists in every religion but in the Baha'i faith because the conditions of the place for the believers who lived in Iran in a place where prejudice against women was so strong women had not probably fulfilled their full potential until the Islamic revolution made their effectiveness, effectiveness uh, so clearly shown to the world and uh, we, I think we discussed that, for example, we uh, didn't have an Iranian Baha'i counselor um, because the community was not yet ready to embrace a woman counselor. I think it was the circumstances of uh, the place and conditions of the time that did not allow the appointment of a counselor. But uh, later on, of course, uh, throughout the world, we have had women, Iranian women, who were appointed and still probably exist among Iranians living abroad who serve as counselors. We have a, another question here from Alexander. Are there valuable resources we could explore about why past revelations didn't stress equality like the Baha'i Faith does? I believe it was the immaturity of humanity when Abdul Baha says that bodily might um, had dominion over the spirit. It's a very important statement that um, people looked at the physics, at the body, and men had larger bodies and they were more forceful physically and therefore they, this had to be addressed by religion in order to spiritualize humanity. Religion seems to have had to give something in order to bring men into the fold. I saw something in the one common faith which I thought was very telling. Uh, may I read that? It says confusion about the role of religion in cultivating moral consciousness is apparent in popular understanding of its contribution to the shaping of society. Perhaps the most obvious example was the, is the inferior social status most sacred texts assigned to women. While the resulting benefits enjoyed by men were no doubt a major factor in consolidating such a conception, moral justification was unquestionably supplied by people's understanding of the intent of the scriptures themselves. With few exceptions, these texts address themselves to men, assigning to women a supportive role in life of both religion and society. Sadly, such understanding made it deplorably easy to attach blame to women for failure in the disciplining of the sexual impulse, a vital feature of moral advancement. In a modern frame of reference, 
attitudes of this kind are readily recognized as prejudiced and unjust. At the stages of social development, at which all of the major faiths came into existence, scriptural guidance sought primarily to civilize to the extent possible relationships resulting from intractable historical circumstances. It needs little insight to appreciate that clinging to primitive norms in the present day would defeat the very purpose of religion's patient cultivation of moral sense. This is a highly significant passage in One Common Faith, page 34 to 35, that uh, your listeners may want to consult and uh, get some insights from. I have written a number of articles on the subject. The latest one is Women and Wisdom in Scripture. Uh, it's uh, in Book 16 of The Lights of Erfan, uh, which I think is out already. There have been other papers also about uh, how uh, the communities in the East and West were prepared by Abdul Baha to embrace gender equality. It addresses some of the um, implications of the question that Alexander has. He may want to consult those papers as well. Rebecca asks, if one wanted to better understand the history of the everyday lives of women in that period, what book would you recommend? Or how would you recommend us educating ourselves about it? Um, I don't really have a book that I can recommend, but by reading the Dawnbreakers and uh, reading into it, for example, why women who are presented in the Dawnbreakers by name are so few in number. Every other woman except Tahere, her maid, and Zainab, uh, and maybe one or two others, other prominent women are mentioned in the dawn brackets uh, through their relationship to a man in their family. Now I'll give you an example. We don't see any reference to Monira Khanum, for, for example, but we see a reference to the sister of Sayyid Yahya, which is the name of her brother, who traveled with her to the Holy Land. Asiya Khanum is the mother of the most great branch. And uh, the greatest holy leaf doesn't appear in the text of the translation of the Dawnbreakers at all. And Shoghi Effendi obviously saw that shortcoming and dedicated his translation to the greatest holy. So the way that I went about it was reading history books and trying to see what was not covered and take my quest from there. Um, God passes by. Um, and there may be some books with, that's being written after the revolution by women living outside Iran, which are in Farsi and haven't been translated. I wouldn't, I don't have any book to recommend, but I could look and um, through your institute or to, through the course, those who take the course, um, mention those books. Right now, nothing comes to mind. Yeah, as, as, since you, as, as you already mentioned, the lives of women were not covered in any kind of depth at that time in any of the existing sources, so it's actually quite tricky to write a book about it. There have been, however, quite a few books that Iranian women have written in English in the last few years about the Qajar period, so there's probably some material uh, that Rebecca could, could uh, find, and if she sends us an email, we may be able to help uh, track that down for her. 
Now, Joan has asked you one of the, the obvious difficult and tricky question, uh, and that is, the question still arises, why the House of Justice does not have women members? I would like to hear the speaker comment on this with her extensive knowledge of women in our faith. Um, I, the only thing I can say, I would rather not get into this uh, discussion because it's really very lengthy and nobody, as the Guardian says, can give an explanation which would satisfy ardent uh, women who um, work in this field of uh, fair treatment or however they want to have it. We know that the House of Justice itself says it has nothing to do with the superiority of men. And Abdul Baha has addressed it, Shoghi Effendi has addressed it, and all of them say that it has nothing to do with men's superiority. Uh, the only thing, and I have written about it, and I can repeat, is that humanity's immaturity can you imagine what's happening in the world today in, among a large population of the world that women don't even have the right to education to, for these men to accept absolute equality in every way. And maybe it's a consideration of wisdom, not maybe, it definitely is, as Abdul Baha says, it's for a wisdom that will become clear as sun at high noon. Now I know many friends, when they talk about this tablet, they say, Abdul Baha said, there is a reason that will become clear. That's not the case. Abdul Baha said, it's for a wisdom. There is a difference between wisdom and reason. I've written about it, and I encourage everybody to consult dictionaries, find out the difference between wisdom and reason, and then ponder upon why Abdul Baha says it's for a wisdom. Reason doesn't come into it the way that I read Abdul Baha's tablet. Thank you. That's fascinating. Go ahead. Do you have another comment? Um, here's another question for you that, that has occurred to me. You mentioned Abdul Baha's encouragement of women uh, briefly. Could you elaborate about some of the ways Abdul Baha encouraged the role of women in the faith, especially in Iran during his ministry? Abdul Baha warned against this or any issue to become a point of contention. He knew how attached men were to their status as a superior gender. And he had to deal with it with supreme wisdom, as he himself in one of his tablets mentioned it. He says, leave it to Abdul Baha. I will deal with this question, and in the end, you yourselves will see the supreme wisdom in it. Abdul Baha sent some Baha'i men to the West, to, the, to Northern America, to the United States particularly, to deepen the understanding of the friends, of the verities of the faith. At the same time, he sent some eloquent and accomplished women from the West to Iran. And when you think deeply about it, it wasn't just to offer courses and to teach in the school. It was also to show the men that women can achieve the same heights that men have achieved. And at the same time, he wanted the friends in the West to become better familiar with the verities of the faith. This was a practical way of educating both the East and the West. 
to come and meet in the middle. He also wanted the Baha'i women in Iran to know that they could educate themselves and scale heights that women in the West had achieved. And it's, it was important for both men and women to see this. And as you review the tablets that Abdul Baha revealed during his ministry to the women in the West, also to the women in the East, you will see that he wants everybody to take a step back and just focus on the goal of Baha'u'llah's revelation, which is the oneness and unity of humankind and universal peace, and that by working together, this can be achieved. Up to then, men had the same. Abdul Baha gave the women a voice. At the same time, he said that women should enter all strata of society, all fields, agriculture, you know, name it, the technology, every sciences. They should become members of parliaments, he said, in order for war to cease. This needed time, and uh, Abdul Baha provided space for women and men both to grasp the significance of equality and said that that uh, whatever greatness was away awaiting humanity could not be achieved without women being equal with men. Thank, thank you for that um, response. I was wondering also if you could comment a little bit about God Passes By and um, you had mentioned in the Dawnbreakers that there's very little about women. Even in God Passes By, I guess the Guardian did not really have access to many of the sources that we have today. Exactly, and um, because it's uh, the review of the history of the faith in its first century from 1844 to 1944. So the Guardian used whatever um, primary material was available to him to write God Passes By. There are some references to women and some very uh, significant references. For example, he talks about the contribution of Laura Dreyfus Barney in compiling some answered questions in some women believers who had become martyrs in Iran that were not covered um, in any history book. Um, but uh, the limitations were there. He had to base whatever he included in God Passes By in the reports that he had received and uh, in eyewitness accounts and if they were not reported from grassroots to the authorities who could then send them to Shabir Fandi, it means uh, the material wasn't there for him to cover. Thank you, um, Baharie. I don't see any other questions at the moment. So I think what we'll do is thank you again very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to the course itself. Thank you so much, Baharie. Yes, and that course begins, is it October 1st it begins? I don't remember. I think October I have the 7th. October 7th. 7th. Yeah, here we are on this. I, I switched to the, the, the last slide I've got, and people can see that the course on the leaves of the Twin Divine Tree starts on October 7th and goes through uh, toward, towards the end of November. And people should purchase the book, of course, in order to be able to take the course. We don't have an electronic copy of the book available. And that particular book has chapters on all of the various women in the uh, families of uh, the Bob and Baha'u'llah, both of the Bob's wives, all three of Baha'u'llah's wives, uh, the daughters of Baha'u'llah, uh, the wife of Abdu'l Baha, one of Baha'u'llah's cousins, Maryam, and uh, I don't know, are there others that I've left out? That seems to me that's a fairly good summary at any rate. Yeah, I think so, yes. Um, 
allow me now to mention our next web talk, um, which is given by Bahariye's daughter, Soveda Ma'ani Ewing. Uh, her talk will be on Sunday, October 25th. Some of the materials that we have put out mention Sunday, October 18th, and we've had to shift the date from the 18th because of the Parliament of Religions in Chicago, in um, Salt Lake City, and because of a Wilman Institute board meeting uh, that same weekend also uh, in Chicago. Uh, her talk will be Building a World Federation, the key to solving our global crises. It'll be the 10th of our 12 web talks, and the remaining two after that, one will be on science and religion, and the last one by Michael Penn will be about uh, human capacity. Uh, so we have these talks coming up, and like I said, we will have others in uh, 2016 as well. If you just go to wilmaninstitute.org uh, and you can click on a tab that says Web Talks, and then you'll get a list of Web Talks, and you can click on a tab that uh, mentions Soveda's talk. That will get you straight to the registration link, and you'll be able to register for her talk. She'll be particularly focusing on the whole issue of uh, strengthening the United Nations or possibly even replacing it with something else that would have greater capacity, similar to the European Union or the American uh, United States, of course, which is a federation of states as well. And these are the two great examples in the world right now today of success in bringing uh, nations together. In the United States, we've even forgotten that the states originally were sovereign states and that for the first 70 or so years, the word United States took a plural verb instead of a single verb. The United States are, not the United States is. <clears throat> so we'll review all that material. And this, of course, also relates to a course Soveda will be giving starting on October 1st on World Federation. So you might want to sign up for the course and um, you'll enjoy the web talk either way, of course. Um, other courses that are coming up that I should mention, communicating as a couple, uh, it actually started yesterday morning, but you really haven't missed anything if you're still interested in that particular course. Soveda Ma'ani Ewing's uh, course, Building a World Federation, starting on October 1st. The Leaves of the Twin Divine Trees by Bahariye uh, Ma'ani, uh, starting on October 7th. We have a course on the Kitabi Egan, a course on the Equality of Men and Women coming up as well. And I could continue on down the list, but it gets quite long since we're averaging about, uh, I think we're going to have five in November and three in December. So we have quite a lengthy uh, repertoire of choices for people who are interested in taking our courses. That's it for today. I want to thank everybody for participating in this web talk. And we look forward to seeing you next month for Soveda's talk on World